Hey, hey, everybody. If you're listening to this, you are listening to the first free hour of this episode of The Shift with Doug McKinty. If you like what you're hearing, please consider subscribing to the show in order to access the full feature-length versions of the podcast, as well as have access to the members' forum, where we discuss potential topics and interviews and dive deep into the overall concept of The Shift. For only six bucks a month, not only do you get the full-length episodes, but also an opportunity to co-create with me, your host, Doug McKinty, the future of the show. Go to www.theshiftnow.com or patreon.com backslash the shift and sign up today in order to help make the shift possible. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Good morning, noon, or night, whenever and wherever you are listening, you are listening to The Shift. I'm your host. My name is Doug McKenty. This episode was recorded on February 26th, 2021. Today on the program, I'm pleased to introduce Etienne de la Boiti Squared, whose book, Government, the Biggest Scam in History Exposed, provides an excellent insight into the concept of voluntarism, the political philosophy that espouses a political and economic system based on freedom of choice and the non-aggression principle. While most of us raised and educated inside the Western paradigm have been indoctrinated with the idea that history is a battle between capitalism and communism and are asked to identify as either right or left within the confines of this paradigm, Etienne posits an alternative view to that of the typical historical dialectic. Rather than discussing politics and economics in terms of this inevitable march of history towards one side or the other, he offers a third option from a perspective of power and criminality. From this point of view, economic inequality and environmental devastation are not an inevitability caused by a predetermined historical pattern. Rather, these societal dysfunctions are a direct result of a criminal class quite simply stealing, then hoarding, vast quantities of wealth, while refusing to pay any form of restitution to the many harmed through the environmental, psychological, and physical damage done in the wake of this conquest. While most of us believe the government is responsible for protecting the population from this type of criminality, Etienne describes the many ways government is used by this criminal cartel to perpetuate and even perpetrate the scam. In his book, Etienne offers up the notion that belief in government is akin to cult indoctrination, a type of psychological abuse that convinces the victim that the authority figure or group leader presents the only path to a higher consciousness, and that this utopia can only be achieved through sacrifice and dedication to that authority. Could it be that a small group of intergenerational crime families colonizing the world through a corporate cartel system of resource centralization have used the idea of government to justify their crimes and convince the unwitting masses to sacrifice their lives in service to a false god? Etienne spends a large portion of his book describing how they do just that. From government control of education to corporate consolidation of almost all news media, he provides the many ways the wealthiest few determine how the multitude of people perceive the world around them. Through these systems of social control, the elite few are able to convince most individuals that theft of personal property through taxation, the use of violence to procure natural resources through unnecessary wars, as well as prosecution for nonviolent behaviors that compete with the cartel's interests, are not only necessary, but morally obligatory. Those not lucky enough to participate in the cartel are literally brainwashed into building their own prison, while considering it virtuous to blindly follow the dictates of the state. While this notion may sound fanciful, Etienne provides 16 gigabytes of primary source information to back it up. I highly recommend the Liberator information package offered with the book for undeniable evidence that governments work extensively with the corporate cartel to engage in just this type of social engineering, resulting in a cult-like indoctrination of the vast majority of the population. Find it all, as well as more about the political philosophy of voluntarism, at www.government-scam.com. As always, you can find out more about The Shift, along with hours of free content, including the roundtable discussions, the Psychology of Lockdown series, and the Thursday Morning Report at www.theshiftnow.com. If you enjoy what you're hearing, please like, subscribe, and share this content as we rely on listeners like you to spread the word. 
I want to thank Etienne de la Boite Squared for agreeing to this conversation, and thank you for helping to make the shift. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, the 71st episode of The Shift. I'm your host, Doug McKinty. I'm joined today by Etienne de la Boise Squared. Uh, he has written a book entitled uh, The Greatest Scam in History, Government, The Greatest Scam in History. Uh, and I'm having him on and we can so we can take a deep dive into exactly what is this thing called government? What is it doing to us? What's the history of it? And how powerfully have we been affected by being raised inside a culture that tells us over and over again that this authority figure uh, is doing us a favor uh, when, in fact, Etienne has a very different opinion. He describes government as a cartel, essentially an organized crime syndicate, and he asks people to break free from what he describes as essentially a psychological program uh, that indoctrinates all of us into the cult of statism. So thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, Etienne. And uh, do you just want to tell people a little bit about yourself and why you wrote this book? Uh, yeah, Doug, thanks. And it's good to be with you, good to be with the audience. And uh, yeah, the, the book Government, the Biggest Scam in History Exposed really breaks down how government was never intended to protect life, liberty, and property, but has really always been intended to rob and enslave populations. And the thesis of the book is that, you know, after monarchy, which I kind of call the original organized crime, you know, you're going to give us your money, we're going to call it taxes, or we're going to hurt you. When that, you know, when, when monarchy fell out of favor and the divide, divine right of king wasn't really selling, uh, the organized crime system came up with democracy to make the people think that they have some kind of say, but easily controlling the outcome of elections through, you know, uh, political assassination, bribery, blackmail, control of the press, control of being able to count the votes. And, uh, and that system uh, has been reinforced. The subtitle of the book is how intergenerational crime run the government and the media. And so the, you know, kind of the, I guess the second major thesis is it's the government and media working together and that the media in the modern age has been monopolized into a, you know, on, on the kind of the old media side, six uh, monopoly corporations running hundreds of subsidiaries to give everybody the illusion that there's these different information sources and then there's been a, also monopolization of kind of on the new media side, about two dozen or so. Um, uh, you know, major internet search engines, video sharing sites, social media sites, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Snopes, LinkedIn, discuss the content engine, uh, meetups and others where uh, dissident voices are being algorithmically censored to control perception on a very, very wide scale. And my book kind of tracks that that program from the you know kind of 1700s where they were censoring mail and not transcribing anti-federalist speeches uh, and you know collapsing newspapers that weren't going along with the new government um, all the way up to you know to modern times where we got this monopolization of the media and uh, you know a, a you know small you know 24 or so companies that have been pro provided unlimited capital to ensure that these control platforms are able to dominate their, you know, part of the DARPA internet. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I've been blown away lately about the power of the media and trying to convince people that the media is essentially a propaganda tool is so challenging because they are given this illusion of choice. They think that there's, well, there's just no way that everybody's in on the conspiracy. There's hundreds of different uh, media options out there. They're all saying the same thing about COVID and lockdowns, and you must be a crazy person if you disagree with what everybody in the mass media says. But what you outline in the book is a centrally controlled media. It's very clear. Uh, the organizations that own these, as you say, the six major media corporations, and then the connections with uh, these other organizations where you can see clearly um, the centralized uh, if you will, conspiracy 
that allows them to um, produce the same message throughout all of these hundreds of different news sources. Do you want to go into that? I know one of your sources was my audience may have seen the uh, the connection between the Bilderberg and the and the Council on Foreign Relations and the Tri Trilateral Commission with all the people on the board of directors and and all of the uh, editors, many of the editors from many of these major sources. Yeah, so that's one of the things that I do in the book, uh, Government, the Biggest Scam in History Exposed, is I do a lot with media ownership charts, because it's one thing if you tell somebody that there's six companies running hundreds and hundreds of subsidiaries to give everybody the illusion of choice, but if you actually show them a media ownership chart uh, or an organizational chart, you know, all of a sudden what you've done is you've made something that was invisible to them now visible. And so, you know, if if you know, when, when you take a look at, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of, you know, these mainstream media outlets that are pushing COVID and you're like, well, there's just no way that they could all be in on it together. And then you know, see the, you know, 2017 uh, chart from Swiss propaganda research that breaks down how three organizations, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, and the Trilateral Commission have maneuvered their membership into all of the key editorships, reporterships, and publisherships, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you, you're like, oh my, now you can actually see how the control system works. You can see what it looks like. We've now made something that was visible, invisible, and you can understand how this organized crime system can sell something like the COVID across dozens and dozens and dozens of ostensibly independent media outlets that are really working together, you know, as a cartel to control perception, because that really is the name of the game. That's the magician's trick. They do illusion, man. They do illusion. And the yeah. way they do it is full spectrum dominance of everything that you see and hear, you know, with enough variety to make you think that you're getting kind of, you know, uh, all these diverse, you know, viewpoints but at the end of the day, you know, the CIA has got uh, something, we've got it in the book uh, that, you know, essentially says, you know, the, it's the, the more sources of information available to, uh, to someone that they're trying to, uh, trying to fool or influence, it makes it harder. But all things considered, if you're able to dominate them all, and you're able to control them all, then your chances of, of the deception being believed go through the roof. And that's really the name of the game. If you're stealing trillions and trillions of dollars, if this, is an, if this organized crime system is able to steal trillions and trillions of dollars through fractional reserve banking, through uh, you know handing trillions of dollars to private banks, private companies through the TARP and the TALF and the bailouts and the stimulus, if it's able to, you know, mandate that everybody use ethanol and, you know, make money for the ethanol right. industry or, you know, whatever, you know, mandatory vaccine, vaccines where, you know, every, you know, corrupt pharmaceutical company that can get their vaccine on the CDC schedule makes an extra billion dollars a year. I mean, you know, once you realize, you know, how much money is 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 being stolen and and you know mulked from you then you realize the cost of controlling the media is very is nothing proportionally it's mice nuts it might have, the the billions and billions they spend to control this like little media circus and put on this like little media show might as well be free compared with the amount that they're stealing from society every single year in all of these various scams uh from fractional reserve banking to the quote-unquote bailouts and stimulus mm -hmm. i mean it is amazing i think i read it's like 32 billion dollars they're going to make on this covid thing and the covid vaccines and i mean that's like first of all there's your motive right <laughs> i mean what do they they may have invested a few billion dollars in uh, in the media and in the uh in the lobbying of the politicians uh, and whatever kickbacks they may have had to give to people at the CDC or, or those kinds of things. But I mean, $32 billion, that's a lot of money. And it, it again, it's a motive for a crime, essentially. I mean, that's what I feel like we're witnessing. And uh, and that we can go only, back. That is, only, that is only a fraction 
that's only the fraction. Wait, we got to stop because that's only a fraction of the theft of the COVID. I mean, the money that they're right. making on the vaccines is one part. But right. we, you know, uh, so I'm uh, I'm in the process of starting a uh, a uh, uh, a nonprofit public policy organization called the Art of Liberty Foundation, and we've been around for about a year. And we've started putting together. We did a, an investigation into the COVID very early on in kind of the April May timeframe of 2020. And we immediately recognized that this was an organized crime scam. We did a, you know, we like we you can find you know, government-scam.com forward slash pandemic. But we found massive evidence of not just foreknowledge that there were certain parties that understood that this event was coming ahead of time and were prepared for it. But we found evidence of disaster capitalism where people were making money with the foreknowledge of what was to come. And so our thesis is is that the COVID is a bank robbery. The COVID is the manufactured reason for the bailouts. Mm -hmm. We're going to hand trillions of dollars to private companies, private banks through these bailouts and stimulus while the American people get chicken feed. And we're going to justify it by spending billions of dollars on our monopoly media system and our, you know, top down centralized control of the people at the CDC and World Health Organization. And we're going to we're going to use that and, you know, flawed disease models and incentives for the hospital and and fraudulent testing and a whole slew of things to make it seem like there's a pandemic, even though the hospitals are absolutely empty. No one is experiencing outside of a couple in New York that appear to be manufactured. There's just nobody experiencing pandemic conditions. There's no reason to lock down society. There's Mm -hmm. no reason to put them through this obedience training. Uh, this is, uh, this has been a bank robbery and, um, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've already largely gotten away with handing trillions and trillions of dollars using the COVID as the excuse for these bailouts and quote unquote stimulus. Right. And then at the same time, they're putting, uh, so much of the middle class out of business. You can only imagine in the next couple of years, we're going to see these corporations using those, trillions of dollars to buy up at depreciated prices, all of the small businesses that are going out of business. Um, and so we're just going to see a huge expansion in the wealth inequality well, and the power that, inequality. It's, it's, it's people. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not just, it's not just the, you know, the, the scoop up at pennies on the dollar, you know, we, uh, you know, we took a look in, in our investigation at one of the folks that appeared to have, you know, where there's massive evidence, prior knowledge and disaster capitalism, we took a look at uh, Bill Ackman at Pershing Capital Management, and you know Bill Ackman supposedly made two point six billion dollars by hedging against the unknowable about the you know was co- you know correctly positioned uh, when the market took its COVID nosedive to the point of being able to reap uh, you know a, a reported two point six billion on you know less than I want to say thirty million dollars in hedges. And so, you know, there's there's evidence that people had, you know, foreknowledge. And then when you take a look at Ackman's portfolio, it was almost like he knew somebody was going to put out of out of business all the mom and pop uh, chain stores, chain restaurants, chain coffee shops, because his portfolio is loaded up with Starbucks and Chipotle and restaurant brands international, which owns twenty six thousand Tim Hortons. Burger Kings and uh, one other restaurant chain. So they're sitting on the sidelines running at running independent mom and pop restaurants out of business uh, so they can come in with chain stores, chain restaurants and chain coffee shops. Uh, this is disaster capitalism. These are the these are the main suspects. And then that's why you saw Bill Ackman on CNBC selling the lockdowns right out of the gate, Mm -hmm. right out of the gate, pushing flat in the curve. It is just amazing. And it's hard to get people to believe this stuff, but I've got to commend you on the way that you've put the book together. Maybe you can mention something about the, the liberator too. the, what is it? Eight gigabytes of information that you've got uh, collected because I started going through that and the primary source documentation there is just unbelievable as well. Um, so why don't you talk about that and a little bit about the book too, with, um, 
all of the charts and graphs and everything that you had, because you mentioned a little bit about how people are visual learners, because it's so important to try to get this information across and this within the book and between the book and the, and the liberator, like I said, um, it's all laid out. It's pretty easy to see. <laughs> yeah. So the, so the book government, the biggest scam in history exposed was designed from the outset to wake up your friends, family, neighbors, thing, people, you know, and, and, and so in my day job, I help uh, world-class organizations learn at the speed of light. And, uh, and I understand how human beings learn. And most learners are visual learners, about 65% of the population. They come to insight when they see information, uh, you know, uh, presented uh, versus hearing it or, you know, kinesthetic learning, you know, learning through touch. And so what we try and do is we try and leverage that and, and again, use, uh, visualizations, historical photographs. We expose the playbook of the, the U.S. using the exact same techniques as the Nazi in East Germany. Mm -hmm. And we actually break down the techniques and we show what it looked like in each time and place. And the reader just kind of, because human beings are really good pattern recognition machines, when they actually see the historical pattern and they realize, oh, this is uh, the United States is, is running this playbook and it's the exact same playbook the Nazis used, and it's the exact same playbook the East Germans used. All of a sudden, you realize, hey, wait a minute, are we the good guys, or is government being, you know, not something that is supposedly helping us, but is something that is being used to rob and control us? And so the book is backed up by this eight gigabit flash drive. We've got an eight gig and a 16 gig flash drive full of evidence, both supporting the book and then full of, you know, uh, some world class um, uh, information resources about voluntarism, which I like to describe as the only ism that's fair for everybody. Nobody gets the ring of power. Nobody gets to use violence on anybody else. And that's the real kind of the good news message of the book is that, you know, we don't need government. Uh, everything that government does uh, from the roads to, you know, what I would call armed protective services to dispute resolution to air traffic control. It can all be done by the free market, by um, mutual aid societies and by real charities and that we would have more wealth and more prosperity if the system wasn't robbing us on this wholesale level, wasn't handing trillions of dollars to private banks and private companies, wasn't, you know, we had a free market in money where the money that you earn should buy more and more every year. It's not mm -hmm. just that they're, you know, stealing the purchasing power out of your money, which they are, that it's in a, an absent, this organized crime monetary system, the money that you earn and save should buy more every single year as productivity improvements and innovations reduce the cost of producing and distributing the necessities and luxuries of life. And so once you realize how much we're being robbed by this government system, then you realize how much money would be available to fix you know, all the poverty in society and all of the, you know, the, the like we could fix, we could fix all the things that government says it's working on and is in many cases actually making it worse. And so, uh, so the, the book and the flash drive are, you know, kind of companion pieces. It's got all of the evidence that backs up the claim about the, you know, the criminality that is going on with respect to the media and the government, but it also provides, you know, all of these valuable resources that, hey, there's a better way. It's called voluntarism. Uh, it's a recognition that the, you know, the world uh, produces spontaneous order and is a self-organizing system and that, you know, we, you know, uh, uh, nobody should have rights that other people don't, including the government. The government doesn't get a pass on morality. That's just a crazy system and a crazy way to organize society. And so as, as people begin to say, oh, okay, we've, you know, we've got kind of taken over by this organized crime system. What do we do about it? Well, the system, the, the solution is to, to devolve the system away, you know, peaceful and orderly secession, of your state from the federal government and then peaceful and orderly secession of your county until all of the goods and services are being provided voluntarily 
and no one gets to use violence, force, or fraud on anybody else. Like I said, it's the only ism that's fair for everyone. And uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, but like I said, I break it down uh, a little bit in the book and working on another book that will break it down in more detail. Can you describe to people what how self-organizing systems work? Because I think a lot of people don't understand this. Um, you know, there's a whole science out there called complexity theory where they analyze this. I, I like, um, when I think about this, I think about the way that nature works because there's no cartel that controls the state of nature. Um, and yet it self-organizes and everything seems to work out. Um, but it's something that I don't think, I think people are so indoctrinated into this feeling that there must be an authority that controls everything or else the world is just going to fall apart. So you, can you get a little bit deeper into this idea of, of spontaneous order or self-organizing systems to help maybe assuage some of those fears that people may have, that if there's not this controlling entity, you know, that, uh, that there, things just wouldn't work, that it would be chaos. Sure. So like everybody, you know, the, the, the government and the monopoly media would have you believe that if there wasn't a government, that things would be, you know, Mad Max chaos and the anarchy purge and, you know, people would be, you know, fighting dogs and cats sleeping together in the street and it would be right. anarchy and chaos and dystopia. But really what they're not, what they're hiding with the government school system and the media are hiding from you is the fact that the world is this kind of self-organizing place and that there are market forces and market dynamics that uh, lead to, you know, everything that the government does being provided, just not by a monopoly provider called the government that demands that only you can use, you have to use its armed protective services. You have to use its dispute resolution. You have to use its air traffic control. You have to use its, you know, on and on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And it says only I get to provide these services. And if you don't like it, then I've got these guys with guns that'll come and they'll arrest you and they'll put you in a cage if you don't go along with the way that we're organizing society to help you. And so what we're saying is, is that there are that just because so if there wasn't armed, if the government wasn't providing the police, which I'll just call armed protective services, well, because everybody in society wants the same thing. We all want to be safe from being robbed or hurt or, you know, anything like that, that absent a monopoly government provider. There might be two or three companies in your neighbor, in your uh, town or city providing armed protective services. Mm -hmm. And uh, but those aren't those agents would not have rights that you don't have. And so you have the inherent right. So, you know, it's it's logical and it's moral and that you have the inherent right to protect your life and your liberty and your property. And so because you have that right yourself, you can delegate that right to a security guard or a night watchman to exercise that right on your behalf. That's a right that can be delegated. Well, you don't have the right to tax your neighbor and you know, steal from your neighbor and call it taxation. And you don't have the right to tell your neighbor whether or not what kind of plants he can smoke. And you don't have the right to tell your neighbor whether or not he should be gambling. And you don't have the right to all these things where the government goes, we have a right to tell you how to live your life, even though you're not hurting anybody or doing anything. And if we catch you doing these things, then we can arrest you. And so um, if your house is getting robbed, you can call your private investigative company, you know, your, 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 you know, your, uh, um, armed defensive services company mm -hmm. and they'll send a guy with a gun who will have the exact same training as the monopoly police. But when he gets there, you know, and he sees that you're playing cards with your friends, he's not going to arrest you and steal the money off the table and call it civil asset forfeiture. <laughs> he only has the rights that you do. So all he can do is exercise force and protective life, liberty, and property. And so by, removing this exorbitant privilege the government claims it has where it gets to use violence on peaceful people that aren't harming anybody and gets to take your money and do all th these things. Um, you still get the armed protective services, but it's provided by ADT or West tech and you probably pay 50 bucks a month for it. And it comes with an alarm system. And if the West tech guy shows up and he's rude to you, 
uh, or he's rifling through your stuff or your truck or car or whatever it is, well, you can fire him and you can go across the street to ADT or West Tech and you know, you will have sent a, sent a message to the provider that their, their person was rude to you or disrespectful or whatever. And you've got a, you know, the market dynamic that, you know, leads to everybody being polite. And then also you've got competition in the marketplace. So in the market, in the, in the neighborhoods where ADT provides security, armed protective services, do they have a better, you know, track record of keeping everybody's homes and properties secure in their neighborhood where they're dominant or does West Tech have a better methodology for keeping the neighborhoods, you know, uh, 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 protected? And right now we've got this crazy system where the prisons and the justice is built on retribution, where it should really be built on restitution because most people that get their stuff stolen out of their car, I mean, you know, they don't want to see an idiot teenager go to jail for like 20 years under a mandatory minimum. Uh, they just want to get their stuff back. Right. And so uh, in a in a voluntarist, libertarian, market-oriented world, um, the, uh, the armed protective services companies would have to appeal to the consumers directly. They'd have to demonstrate a track record of success to win your business. And they would have to be focused on restitution instead of retribution, because anybody that wants that, that is, wants their stuff protected obviously wants to get it back. And so who's doing a better job of getting it back for you? Well, it's obviously not the government. And so, so these are the market dynamics that get glossed over in the government school system. Uh, you know, there's no iron claw law of the universe that says that you have to have a government. Um, that's the big lie of the government system. That's what they're hiding from you is they're not telling you the alternative that the world is a self-organizing place and that there's these market forces that would provide all of the goods and services that you know, get from the government, but it just wouldn't be a monopoly. It would be, they'd be delivered a lot more efficiently. They'd be delivered a lot less cheaply. The people would be a lot less, um, uh, the employees would be a lot more polite and they'd be focused on delivering a quality product and satisfying the customer instead of having these sinecures where they get to be rude and whatever. Um, by the way, I mentioned air traffic control. The Canadians have already privatized air traffic control. And so the planes aren't falling out of the sky in Canada. And so everyone listening to this, where this sounds shocking, be surprised to find out how many different people and or places and services have already been privatized all the way down to complete communities. So this isn't something that's pie in the sky. This is something that's already going around, going on all over the place. The future uh, 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 is here. It's just not evenly distributed to quote William Gibson. Yeah. I mean, as I, as I'm listening to you talking about this, I think the idea that really blows people's minds is, I mean, you're not talking about, uh, n no government as much as you're talking about choice of government without the, this idea of geographical boundaries. Like, I mean, why can't people choose the, the service, the government quote unquote service that they want without this notion of boundaries? And how did the idea of boundaries even become a thing? And this is where it starts to really look like a protection racket to me, when a government has come in and said, here are the, nat the, the national boundaries, and within these boundaries, you have to do what, what our centralized authority says. Um, I, I've just thought about this um, quite a bit. At the beginning of your book, you kind of mentioned that government really is just an idea. Like, you, don't, you can't go and touch the government. And so um, just how interesting is it that, uh, that I think if people can get get over this idea that there has to be geographical boundaries and within those boundaries, we have this protection racket, but instead there can be really multiple governments, multiple currencies, multiple ideas about how to be governed. Another thing that I've thought about uh, a lot in terms of having conversations with people who are more socialist oriented or more community oriented is like, why don't you guys just organize your own 
group that provides all these goods and services to everyone and just do it voluntarily. I mean, we don't have to have these arguments, right? We can we can make voluntary choices and you can participate in whatever kind of organization that you choose. And it doesn't have to be defined by these geographical boundaries. It, it can be just a personal choice. So you can still have all the goods and services distributed however you like, just choose to join that group that does it like this. And it, it can be all right, that can work out without the without the need for the geographical boundaries. Well, let's talk about that because because um, you use the word government, I use the word governance. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I don't believe that you can have a legitimate government where if you define government as a group that has a monopoly on the use of force across a you know a specific geographical region, um, I don't believe that it's legitimate for any group to acqu- to legitimately acquire the ability to use force on the majority or on minorities within the majority or anybody else. Like it's it's impossible. It's illegitimate. If somebody is using force on other people, that means they're the bad guys. That's how you know that the system is illegitimate. That's how you know the system is wrong. And there can never be a legitimate government because if you don't have these these rights yourself, if you don't have the right to take money for your neighbor or make up rules for your neighbor, then you cannot delegate a right that you do not have to the government or a representative to represent you doing something you don't have the ability to do your, do, uh, you know, do yourself. And so if the, if the power for the government to do what it did does not come from we the people, Because we, the people, cannot delegate rights that we do not have ourselves to representatives to represent us doing something we don't have the ability to do ourselves, then it's a scam. It's been a scam from the beginning. Literally, they just said, we're in charge. We get to make up rules for everybody, steal the wealth of others. And they put it on a fancy piece of paper, and they did some rituals, and then they got the newspapers of the time to proclaim it valid, and then over time, you know, controlling the information that people had through the mandatory government schools and using this to meet this prop, this meet this weaponized media propaganda system where every single channel, everybody turns on, oh, it's legitimate that we get to rule you. It's legitimate. It's legitimate. It's legitimate. People have just said, I guess it must be legitimate. It's been going on for so long. Right. And it's only, you know, a very small minority that's very fast growing to the majority that's that's realized hey, this is not legitimate at all. It's not moral. It's not logical. It doesn't work real well. And now it's getting openly tyrannical. And now, you know, in in Washington, D.C., it's to the point where on the federal government level, they're ripping the copper pipe out of the wall and stealing the silverware. And I mean, it's just a wholesale, we're we're robbing you. And so I think now society is, you know, rapidly waking up. Now we've got the internet, we've got self-directed, you know, information. It's an information revolution. Part of the reason we do the the flash drive uh, on, you know, on a credit card sized wafer drive. Uh, part of the reason that we do that as a credit card size flash drive is to get around the algorithmic censorship. So, so we're getting around using flash drives and using uh, uh, drop boxes and using, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, decentralized open source um uh you know blockchain based content management systems uh like library or like um uh, the interplanetary file system we're getting around their censorship slowly and surely more and more people are waking up to how the system works every single day and so that is a that is a dynamic that's only going in one direction because once you realize how the game works and the illegitimacy of government and the fact that it's you know the media is in on it and 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 that they're controlling all the different channels once you know how the magician does the trick it's very very hard for you to get fooled by the magician's trick and so um, i'm very optimistic that you know we're going to uh, expose the system and then the question becomes you know how do you how do you transition into voluntary market based uh, systems from this monopoly system as the, you know, the illegitimacy of it is exposed. How do you minimize the, you know, the hard landing, uh, you know, should the dollar rapidly lose value, uh, you know, as, or, you know, there'd be some kind of other economic, uh, uh, dislocation. 
But so that's the that's kind of what we're working on at the Art of Liberty Foundation. Cool. I mean, there's so much to talk about here. I'd like to take a step back, I think, and just have a discussion about how this, because a lot of people think that in a free society, and this is what kind of, I, you know, what I've been almost dwelling on lately is this idea of projection. I think people are taking what's happening now, and when you offer a solution based on decentralization, then they project what is happening onto the potential solution um, because they, you know, typically people will say, well, we can't have free market capitalism or this libertarian ideal because then it'll just be this dog eat dog world and only the only the most powerful would rise to the top and then we'd control the most powerful individuals, you know, would control everybody else. Um, they would They would get, I mean, this is the classic, Marxist concept that the means of production will get eaten up by the very few after you know the winners of the competition will will then dominate everybody else but the irony is to me I'm looking around here and I'm thinking this is exactly what's happening right now this is <laughs> and the solution is actually to decentralize power so these people can't they're using the government to centralize power but you know what I'm talking about. This is a, this is the typical, I think, number one go to when you start talking libertarian ideas with someone. They're going to say, "Well, if we didn't have the government, then just a handful of people would take control." Well, the government is a handful of people taking control, right? How do you deal with that one? Well, absolutely. And the thing you got to understand is that you know people. Uh, one of the weapons that was used against the population as a whole was stunning their intellectual development by not teaching them grammar, logic, rhetoric, the trivium, the quadrivium, mm -hmm. the, you know, giving them the basis is that, you know, uh, you know, giving them an understanding of market forces. In fact, the market is always, dom you know, is, is essentially demonized in, you know, especially at the collegiate level, you know, Keynesian economics is, is taught, you know, versus Austrian or, you know, market-based economics. And so, so, uh, so most people, what they think of today as being capitalism isn't really capitalism. It's what I would call crony capitalism. It's a mixed economy. And it's very, very unfair to all of the different per participants for the federal government to be able to pick winners and losers, set interest rates, have a monopoly on the currency, uh, you know, and, and, and just have so much economic misallocation by taking money that would be better invested in, um, uh, you know, in uh, profitable uh, businesses producing goods that people want and instead and, and doing research into things that people want. And instead, it's being invested into weapon systems that we don't need to fight wars that we've been lied into with lies and manufactured intelligence. And if you didn't have that misallocation, if you if if you if the government wasn't stealing, you know, half of everybody's income in overt taxes covert taxes and inflation, if the government wasn't devaluing the dollars that people earned and saved through fractional reserve banking and the inflation that that causes, then um, everybody would be, you know, would be uh, crazy wealthy and we would be able to afford everything, you know, we'd be able to afford um, uh, to take care of the poor, the needy, the disadvantaged, and, you know, uh, um, without confiscatory taxations voluntarily, where that money invested in private charities and private mutual aid societies is going to be spent way better than money wasted on government programs being administered, you know, from Washington, D.C. in 50 plus different states where the people are different, the situations are different, the, you know, the, uh, the, the problems are different, um, you know, uh, the market produces better results and it's more moral and it's fair to all versus what we have now is we've got crony capitalism where the federal government is able to predict you know, uh, pick monopoly winners and losers. It's able to grant monopoly privileges. It's able to let these banks create money out of thin air, even though it's inflationary and robbing the value of the money that people earn and save. Um, uh, the moral system is the better system. The market system is the better system. I'm trying to explain to people the difference. This isn't capitalism. This is government. This is socialism. This is 
crony capitalism. This is how you get robbed. And I don't blame people for being against this system. I just want to make sure that they're not tarring it as a cat as capitalism because it 100% isn't. And the difference would be in a capitalist system, you're spending your own money. You're getting the education you want, not the one that is being forced upon you. Uh, you're voting every day with your dollar and the only way to win in a capitalist system is to produce a product or a service that is of a better quality uh, than your competitor. And if you satisfy enough customers uh, with the goods and services that they want, then you make money. That's fair. That's honest. That's the way it ought to be. Not we, you know, there's going to be some people in Washington, D.C. that are going to rob Peter to pay Paul and be able to pick the winners and the losers and to be able to use violence across the board on people that are haven't hurt anybody just because some people signed a piece of paper hundreds of years ago. Right. It just doesn't make it. Nice. <laughs> We're getting towards uh, the end of our time together. I, I get that, but I did want to um, focus on for a little while, do kind of a, a bit of a deep dive, maybe for another 15 minutes or so, if I can keep you about this, you really go into in the book, the idea that statism is a cult and that we are all, or many of us have been indoctrinated into a cult. And I thought that this was so important for people to understand um, that that's what we're dealing with. Because I mean, I, for one, spent a lot of time, you know, I've read the Austrian economics. I'm trying to argue with people. We should do this. We should do that. But reason doesn't really work because we're dealing with cult programming. It's it's psychology. I'm actually right now producing a psychology of lockdown series where we're just getting into the psychology of all of this um, because it's it's been so frustrating when you're showing people facts, when you're showing people all of the, I mean, there's just reams and reams of information that shows that a free society can really work for the benefit of mankind. And it's like, they don't believe you. And I mean, you, you know, on your eight gigabyte drive, reams and reams of information that show you exactly how this, uh, this organized crime syndicate, this cartel is working to manipulate and control everyone to their own benefit. And still you show them this information, it can't change their mind. So, you know, what is it that, uh, and we can go way back. One of the things I was going to, I'll just bring it up now too. I mean, your your pen name is after a, a 16th, 17th century philosopher who wrote something called the Discourse Concerning Voluntary Servitude. Mm -hmm. And so going back for hundreds of years, we've had people who are aware of this. I mean, this is a long, hundreds of years long lineage of psychological programming where these people know what they're doing and how to indoctrinate people into the cult of statism so that we're all essentially building our own prisons right now. I mean, people are going around spending 40 hours a week, you know, going to work, building the prisons for their children that their children are going to have to live inside of uh, a decade or two from now uh, if we don't change what's going on right now. And they don't think anything of it. They think it's just normal and they're doing this great work for mankind, building the technocracy, working on the centralized blockchains and, and uh, um, you know, the pay for success bonds that are coming up and these financial uh, units that they're creating to build this whole system that's that they want to create as part of this great reset. And we're doing it to ourselves, you know, it's crazy. And it takes just this huge amount of psychological programming. So um, why don't we get into that? What do you mean when you talk about the cult of statism? So uh, government is a scam. It's run by intergenerational organized crime, and they're using techniques to rob and control society that in some cases are hundreds and hundreds of years old. And in some cases, they're thousands of years old. The original Etienne de la Boissy, uh, you know, wrote in the, you know, kind of 1560s, uh, the Discourse of Voluntary Servitude, where he was one of the first to really catalog these unethically manipulative techniques used to achieve, uh, a, you know, not just obedience to the government, but fealty and mm -hmm. adoration of the right. population. And so uh, for... Centuries and centuries and centuries, rulers have been using uh, this playbook, these you know various techniques. And one of the main techniques they do is they slide the belief in having a government to the population as a religion, but they don't call it a religion. 
-hmm. but they're using all of the tricky, sneaky, uh, unethically manipulative tools and techniques of an unethically manipulative religion or cult to slide this religion to the population when they're young in the mandatory government schools and in the youth programs. Mm -hmm. And so what the, that's a, you know, the book government, the biggest scam in history uh, exposed really breaks down is this playbook of we're going to give the population a flag, which I refer to as the indoctrinate, the artificially indoctrinated holy symbol. And we're going to have them, send the kids to the church school where the priest, the teacher will get their during their formative years, teach them that it is legitimate and desirable and necessary, necessary to have a government, even though there's no ironclad law of the universe that says that it, you've got to have a government or that it's desirable or that it's necessary. But that idea is going to be indoctrinated into the kids in this mandatory school system where the artificial holy symbol is going to be imbued with uh, with powers and you, you know you you you're going to pledge your allegiance to it thousands and thousands and thousands of times before you're old enough to understand what you're pr- pledging your allegiance to you're going to sing the hymns in the football games you're going to uh, the, the school is going to take you to Mecca Washington DC Mecca where they're going to take you into the cathedral that is the capital that looks like the Vatican for a reason. And they're going to take you into the temples and they're going to show you the deities of Lincoln and Jefferson. And it's going to be very, very reverent and it's going to be hush. And then the media propaganda system is going to take the flag and it's going to weave it product place it into the movies, the 800 plus movies, 1000 television shows that the, Department of Defense or the intelligence agencies have provided funding for over the past several decades, many of which have nothing to do with the military or defense or anything like that, but are just being used to product place the American flag. They're using a technique called anchoring. Anchoring Mm -hmm. is where the propagandist in a film, I like to use the example of uh, The Martian with Matt Damon, will bring the audience to a moment of high positive emotion. And then right. show them the flag. Yeah. And then they'll, the NBA has put the American flag on the backboard so that you exalt, so that you subconsciously associate the exhilaration of the goal with the flag. And we're going to put the flag on the, on the NFL players' helmets where they're forbidden to take them off. And, and so we're going to use all these like little tools and techniques to make you feel all lovey and dovey and warm and cuddly around the flag. Um, at the same time that we're using other techniques to ensure obedience, which is why in the mandatory government school, you've got to ask permission to go to the bathroom. You got to get permission from a government employee just to use basic necessities. They're going to have you walk in lines and they're going to have a, you know, for, for years and years and years have absolute control over you where the government employee is, you know, uh, either praising you or, you know, um, Uh, giving you the carrot or giving you the stick to mold you into a taxpayer. And then that's the first level of initiation is the mandatory government school. Then the second level of initiation is for something called order followers. And order followers are uh, going to go through the Cub Scouts, the Boy Scouts, the uh, Explorer program, the GROTC, the ROTC, police and military training. And by the time they go through that, that other six or seven levels of conditioning, uh, they're going to begin winning awards, Cub Scout Adventure Loops, Boy Scout Merit Badges for you know, reciting how to be a good citizen and for how to fold the flag and caress the flag. And when the flag gets old, we can't throw the flag away. We've got to bury the flag because it's a holy object and it can't touch the ground. And they're going to be giving you the the religion of the state and around its relics and around its symbols and everything like that. At the same time, they're going to shave the kids' heads, put them into uniforms, uniform, the single form conformity. Mm -hmm. And they're going to begin controlling the information that they receive, getting them, uh, you know, indoctrinated into command and control, hierarchical obedience. uh, And they're going to get them to set aside their own personal morality 
and agree to use violence for the artificially indoctrinated status religion. And so that is really, it is a scam and the basics and the, and the, the core of the scam is that they're controlling the information you receive from very early on and indoctrinating you into a pseudo religion called statism. And they're creating a belief system that says that it's your duty to hand over half your income in tithes. It's your duty to obey people that, you know, are the elected representative just because some people decided to vote for some people in an election. I didn't vote for anybody in the election. I don't like, I'm not, I'm saying that system's illegitimate. That doesn't give right. me the ability to rob and control others because some people decided to vote in your, in the system, but they're tricking, they're tricky, tricky, tricky. And so because they're controlling the information at this formidable stage, most people have never really thought, Hey, is that legitimate? Is that desirable? Uh, should government have the ability to use violence on peaceful people, you know, to engineer society or to, to raise revenue on our friends and neighbors? Like, is that legitimate? Uh, they were never ever because they were they were given that idea as a child before they were old enough to really evaluate what was you know being said mm -hmm. by a government employee with a vested interest and in them believing it. Um, you know, they just never really thought about it. And so what we, we do in the book is we expose the, the immorality and the illogical nature of that idea. And we help people free their minds because they can see how the system works. They can see the historical patterns. They can see the, the, you know, the, the tools and the techniques. We expose these tools and techniques like most people might not have noticed that they're using religious symbolism in their, you know, in the, in the propaganda, when they photograph the presidents and the politicians. But when you throw three dozen examples of presidents with halos and penumbras and in front of Jesus and religious symbology, you realize, Hey, they're doing that on purpose. They're, they're running game on me. They're running game on the population. Right. And because you see it with your own eyes, it goes to your brain. You get this deeper understanding. And so that's what we're doing that, you know, the, the book has been designed to uh, reveal the these historical patterns um, and using visualization make what was invisible to people now visible and then once they see how that control system you know is laid out the monopolization of the media how these people have been maneuvered into these you know uh, uh, into all these different organizations then you can really understand it because you see it with your own eyes you understand how the system works in a way that you didn't understand before because it was invisible to you. Right. Right. And will you spend a few minutes talking about the, like things like the Tavistock Institute as well? I mean, I just want, because it's, I think it's a big part of this whole disinformation campaign or propaganda campaign where the conspiracy, you know, you get called a conspiracy theorist when you start to see all of these things. And certainly if you start talking about a multi-generational crime syndicate that has complete control of the media, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing that most people are going to go, my God, there's no way. That's not true. That's just crazy talk. Um, but when you see... Yeah, like, until they see it with their own eyes. Well, that's... So that, right. yeah, yeah, I mean, really, so the magic what I'm doing is, yeah, it sounds all crazy. Let's see what it looks like. And then they're like, holy crap, there's six <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. And because they see it with their own eyes, then they have an understanding of it. And when you see something, you 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 it doubles the comprehension and it doubles the retention. So you're gonna, right. I'm able to bring somebody to that moment of insight, you know, much much quicker than just me trying to explain it to them. I'm gonna show it to them. I show it to them, and then that's the difference. I think in what I do and what a lot of people do is I'm 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 letting people see the system with their own eyes. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I noticed in the book that I, I actually really appreciate it was when you kind of lined up, like, here's how the U.S. government does it. Here's how Nazi Germany did it or East Germany. Here's how the Soviet Union did it. And they're just like going down the list of the, they're just doing the same things. I mean, it's, it's just flavor. amazing. So many it's people think, right. And people think the U.S. is like, Oh, we're the free country and, and, you know, we're fighting against the tyrants that act like that, but it's like, no, we're doing exactly the same thing here in this country that has been done in the most tyrannical countries in the history of the world. 
And as you say, not only that, but they're following a playbook that's been, they've been following this playbook for hundreds of years. You can go back to, um, you know, your, your name to plume and the, the philosophers have been writing about how to do it or Machiavelli, right. have been telling these guys figuring out, and now they're hiring guys like Dr. Fauci who figure out how to, you know, how to maintain it or, or, uh, funding the, the, um, uh, Tavistock Institute or the Stan Stanford research Institute or all of these people that are actually doing the work of how do we, you know, how do we manipulate the people and manufacture the culture that we want and manufacture this consent so that they're actually going to work for us and build their own prison? Um, yeah. be because that's what it takes. It takes that level of indoctrination. They can't, they can't force all of us to be slaves. That's, you know, that would take way too much military might, police might, whatever. Um, it's way cheaper to do this, this psychological indoctrination. And then people are doing it and, and people are even self-policing, even with the, you know, this mass stuff or the social distancing, the things that are going on right now, the, the government doesn't have to be there making sure that we're all doing it because your neighbor's doing it. Your neighbor's policing your neighbor. Um, it's, it's, this is really powerful stuff. And I just, um, you know, definitely appreciate that your book is really helping, to wake people up out of it. I, I think coming from this point of view of voluntarism, I've, I've really kind of noticed this, that all the people who are voluntarists, I think once you make that decision to yourself, that moral decision that you believe we can build a society based on nonviolence, then when you have that principle and you analyze politics or the news or you know all of this information that's coming at you from that point of view, it's like, this organized crime syndicate just makes itself, you can start to see it. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been dwelling on just a little bit lately is I think if you don't have that principle, if you're not focused, then it's really easy for them to manipulate you. Uh, have you had that experience? Is that is that one of the ways that you help to try to open people's minds to this information? I mean, you know. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. So, so um uh, being, you know, num number one, there's a moral certainty and understanding right from wrong and being able to say, I'm not going to support these policies because if I was to support these policies, I would be advocating violence on my friends and neighbors. And I don't have the right to do that. I don't have the right, right to tell them how they should be ruled. And so therefore, I'm not going to participate in a system that is trying to trick me into legitimizing the system through my participation. And so, and that is really a con because, you know, the average voter doesn't really vote, you know, they like, oh, you get to decide with your vote. And no, I mean, it's, you're just absolutely being tricked. Even if the elections weren't rigged, it's still illegitimate because for the same reason that, you know, me and my friend can't, you know, vote to rob Doug because we outnumber him. It doesn't matter if there's three of us instead of two of us or 10 of us or 250 million of us. There is no additional person that is going to make something that's inherently immoral, robbing Doug moral just because the mob decided to vote for it. Right. And so once you realize the, the moral bankruptcy and the moral illegitimacy and the illogic nature of statist ideas and socialist ideas and, and, and the belief system that we're going to achieve perfection in society by robbing these people over here and letting a centralized government and, you know, a capital city divide everything up fair for everybody. Once you realize, no, that's stealing. I'm not going to, I don't want to be part of stealing. I'm not advocating stealing. Y'all shouldn't be stealing. You know, you're already halfway there to being free. And part of being free is being mentally free, gubernari mente, control of the mind, mm. gubernari to govern and control, mente the mind. Part of breaking free of that control is realizing that you have to be a moral person, that karma is always operating at full power in the universe, and that nobody, uh, you know, uh, uh, should be able to rob Peter to pay Paul even if it's for good, we just don't, you know, we just don't steal. And, to, you know, to paraphrase the old abolitionists, um, it doesn't matter, you know, who's going to pick the cotton. We just can't have slavery. And so it doesn't matter, like, like whatever, 
your reason for wanting to have government. Well, we've got to have government because of X, or we've got to have government because of Y, or if it wasn't for government, like whatever you think the government is going to provide to you would not be provided some other way. It just doesn't matter because we can't have government because it's immoral. It's illegitimate. It's wrong to steal money from people that earned it and saved it and redistribute it through the political system. And so once you get, get, get that out of your head and quit advocating to rob your friends and neighbors, to put your favorite politicians schemes and practice uh, everybody is better off in society as each individual person realizes how their own individual morality or lack thereof is, is impacting their neighbors. Um, that's a powerful way to to wake people up to uh, to the illegitimacy of government, the illegitimacy of voting, and, uh, and right. not, not being tricked into a rigged card game that is designed to rob you. Because you're not going to win in their rigged card card game. You're not going to have a third party come up. You're not. It's a rigged card game. You're not going to win in it. The only way to win is not to play. Yeah, right on. Well, that sounds great. That sounds like a great place to wrap it up. I think it's so true. If you have that kind of moral compass and you understand the difference between, you know, good and evil or moral and amoral behavior, then the rest of the well, as you call it, the the intergenerational crime syndicate and the behavior uh, that includes the manipulation of the education system, that includes the manipulation of the financial system, uh, that includes the manipulation of the media, it just starts to become apparent. Um, because once you have that moral principle to to view, like if you're looking at the world from that paradigm, then suddenly it's not a conspiracy. It's just clearly, you know, corrupt behavior. <laughs> I mean, this is what happens when we let, you know, we let criminals rule society and they've been ruling it for such a long time and they've mastered this art of uh, psychological control um, that now it's become more and more difficult to break out of it. But um I really appreciate the book and uh, the Liberator package. All that information, that primary source information is really incredible. So I urge all of my listeners to go check it out. I'll throw it up uh, in the bookstore uh, on my website. So you can, you can look it up under uh, Etienne. And, uh, and um, I urge everyone to check it out. The, the visualizations, the charts and the graphs, and the way the book is laid out is excellent for those of you who are visual learners, which is a lot of you. Uh, and again, the Liberator information is just packed with primary source information that will really wake you up to, to how the world really works. So, at the end, do you want to um, just close up? A couple of final words, uh, talk about the book a little bit, and uh, and let people know where they can find out more. Well, I'd just say that uh, it's government-scam.com. And as I mentioned, you know, we did a full-scale investigation into who was behind the pandemic. It's a little bit uh, uh, dated, but that's government-scam.com forward slash pandemic. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it's the exact same system we break down in the book. And if you want to wake up your friends and your family, we think we've got a really, really sharp tool uh, for your toolkit at government-scam.com. Sounds very good. Uh, And I'll just take a moment to say that you've been listening to The Shift. I've been your host. My name is Doug McKenty, and you can find all of my stuff at www.theshiftnow.com. I got uh, hundreds of hours of interviews there at this point. And uh, sign up for the newsletter, and I will uh, send you weekly updates about uh, everything that I'm producing. Um, You can also find me on Twitter at dmckenty. Uh, and on Facebook and YouTube at The Shift with Doug McKenty, or just Google Doug McKenty, and, and you can get it all. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. And thank you so much, Etienne, for the work that you've been doing. Really appreciated the conversation. And uh, you have a great day. Peace, love, and volunteerism. Well, all right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That was my conversation with Etienne de la Boiti Squared. Uh, I really enjoyed the book, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm just starting to come to realize that I am a voluntarist at heart. I really always have been. Um, It's been kind of an amazing journey for me. I've moved into a community here in Northern California that's largely progressive, and I've spent just a lot of time not only within the community here, but also on social media, talking to people who are more socialistic-minded, including... um, 
on social media uh, a lot of anarcho-communists, which uh, which typically argue against the voluntarists as anarcho-capitalists, and it seems too much like uh, capitalism. And and if we had this voluntary society, then uh, it would ultimately result in a society like this, where we have uh, governments and corporations, and the strong will survive. Um, and I've I've really spent a lot of time listening to these debates and listening to people who uh, believe in these alternative systems. And ultimately, I have just come to the conclusion that nonviolence is the way forward. We can create a society based on nonviolence. Uh, we just have to respect that other people can make individual choices as adult human beings and that we can have a society that's based and founded on that idea and it will work out. Uh, it'll work out in the same way that the state of nature works out, the way that a forest works out. There doesn't need to be an authority, a government that controls uh, where the oak trees get planted, where the pine trees or the redwood forests get planted. You know, <laughs> nature is a self-organizing system, and that is what voluntarism is all about. Ultimately, after all these conversations and all this time that I spent, I realized that things like anarcho-communism or socialism or any of these other ideas about how to live your life are subsets of voluntarism. No voluntarist believes that you can't start a commune if you want to. Uh, you can't organize your friends however you like. Um, there's not even hard and fast rules about you have to use a currency, you have to work for a wage, you have to uh, do property rights in a certain way. All of these arguments and conflicts uh, just go by the wayside once you establish within your mind that you can live your life without being aggressive, without imposing your belief system on other people. I mean, think about it in terms of COVID right now. Uh, so many people believe that the government, and in a lot of cases these governors have, uh, have uh, applied emergency powers to themselves. There's not even a democratic process going on. The governors are just able to do what they want, tell people what to wear, tell people that how close they can be with each other, tell people how many family members they're allowed to have over for a holiday. Uh, and this is all right to the vast number of people. Uh, it's just mind-boggling to me uh, that allowing one person this much control over our personal lives through the threat of violence, of course, you'll be fined, you might have prison time, uh, and certainly uh, a lot of psychological violence, passive-aggressive shaming from other members of the community if you don't follow orders. Uh, we're, we're dealing with all of this all the time right now, and this concept of voluntarism really is the solution. Uh, and the thing that really got me about Etienne's book is how deeply he goes into this idea of belief in state is really just a cult indoctrination. And I've been doing a lot of uh, delving into the psychological aspects uh, in terms of the psychology of lockdown series, uh, interviews that I've done on the idea of scientism uh, as, a, as a belief system, essentially a patriarchal belief system that's not even reflective of peer-reviewed scientific papers, just reflective of what the government or the authority says is science, and how people who are following the authority figures, just blindly following them, believing what they're being told is the truth, um, these people are acting like victims of, of cult abuse. And so, as I got into Etienne's book, uh, and he really started delving into this, it just really clicked with me that this is so true, that, that the state is psychological abuser, that we are traumatized into following these orders, we're traumatized into a, a fear porn world from the mainstream media, as Etienne describes how controlled it is, just a handful of corporations controlled, the narratives are controlled from just a few organizations like the, the Council on Foreign Relations, and then the fear porn from the mainstream media triggers everyone into a fight or flight mode where they're instantly seeking uh, direction from the authority figure and considering doing following the authority to be the virtuous action. Then shaming the rest of us who don't want to follow the author authorities uh, dictates or even just for questioning those dictates. So it's fascinating what's going on here in terms of uh, the psychology of the situation and really understanding 
this idea that it is a very akin, if not exactly the same as cult indoctrination, uh, just being essentially brainwashed into believing uh, in authoritarianism, essentially. And the idea of voluntarism just breaks things down. It says, hey, individuals can make choices like adults. Uh, unless those choices are actually hurting someone else, then there's no need to pay any kind of restitution. Um, and we can figure out how to work things out individual case by individual case. Um, and I just don't see the issue with it. Again, the conflicts that uh, people uh, from, you know, the anarcho-communists and others that have with it, it's like, hey, you're free to live your life the way you choose uh, and free to convince others to try to live uh, at, at, by your example. Um, but the idea of using violence to force people uh to conform to certain lifestyle choices, it's simply unnecessary, and it's really, uh, ultimately, that's what what's immoral. So then Etienne goes on to describe that the state is really not just, is it essentially using this sort of cult psychology to indoctrinate people into following it, but it's actually a front group for uh, a multi-generational crime syndicate, which I mean, I think clearly we can see that this corporate system of colonialism that's been, uh, the lineage goes straight back to the feudal systems of Europe, and the transnational corporations are all connected back to uh, these older systems of colonization. And clearly, that corporate system, those at the top of the corporate system, I mean, just the act of lobbying Congress alone, passing bribes to get laws passed, this is how they operate. So this cartel system of resource extraction and distribution, manufacturing and distribution, which has controlled uh, essentially the British Empire for the last three, four hundred years uh, and spread out throughout the rest of the world, um, is working in tandem with government power to enforce the criminal cartel. Uh, I think once you get this idea that people, adults, should be allowed to make choices for themselves as long as they're not hurting anyone else, and that then use of aggressive force is criminal behavior, once you click into that, then the rest of the so-called grand conspiracy uh, becomes very clear. And I've noticed that uh, even prior to uh, this conversation, is that other voluntarists like uh, Derek Bros, who identifies as an agorist, but it's part of the same philosophy, or uh, James Corbett, you know, they see through the facade of government, of legitimate government, and they see the criminal behavior that's behind all of it. And it's so difficult if you're participating in the left-right paradigm and you have this different point of view that you think that there's the, this historical dialectic that's going on and either the end of history is capitalism and representative democracy or the end of history is this Marxist utopia of communism and that there's this inevitable materialistic historical process that's going on and we're sort of participating in this, then you don't see through the facade that once you, I think about my discussion with Tanner Cook too about Nietzsche when it comes to this, because Nietzsche, instead of believing in these materialistic dialectics that come from Hegel and Marx, Nietzsche boiled everything down to power. And once you see through the historical dialectic and recognize that it's not really an accurate description of what's going on, then you see behind that facade, that legitimization of government action, and you can clearly see that this is simply criminal behavior. This is a power play by very powerful families. It's been going on for a long time. It's called the history of colonization. It's called the patriarchal system. You know, we can go on and on uh, about the history of this, but the question in my mind, especially with the coronavirus, since the power of this criminal a cartel has, has become so powerful, and not powerful because they're forcing us to wear masks, powerful because people are choosing to wear masks and choosing to enforce that mask wearing on others. The government, the, the, the protection racket, doesn't even have to use violence. It can use psychological violence. It's emotional abuse. It's not just physical abuse. So it's, it's harder to see. But uh, I want uh, I just uh, was happy to have this conversation with Etienne because I think that uh, if you're interested, if you're not familiar with the ideas of voluntarism, I urge you to check out the book. Um, um, 
and I also urge you to get the Liberator package. This eight, you can get eight uh, gigabytes or sixteen gigabytes. It's got loads of primary material stuff that I hadn't even seen uh, that really point to how the government and the corporations work together behind the scenes, spending literally billions and billions of dollars on social engineering, mind control techniques, and then using those techniques through the corporate media cartel, the consolidation of of corporate media and the public education system to ensure that people only learn the history that the government and the cartel want us to learn and only learn the left-right paradigm without understanding that there are all these other options and enforcing everyone to learn the same thing. So very few people uh, get um, exposed to other ideas. Um, and again, just because this notion of voluntarism really, it seems to me, breaks people away from the left-right paradigm and sees things, allows people to see things from this power paradigm point of view, this criminality point of view, it changes and suddenly you can, you can start to see how the quote-unquote conspiracy is actually working. People say, oh, you know, everybody's not involved in the conspiracy, but yeah, I mean, the reason why they are is because so many of us have been indoctrinated essentially into this cult-like belief in the state and in the state corporate apparatus. So I uh, really want to urge everybody to check it out. I'll give you the website, Etienne de la Boite Squared. Uh, it is www.government-scam.com. And really, uh, if you will, I think you got to throw in a couple extra bucks to get either the 8 gigabyte or the 16 gigabyte package, the Liberator package. I'm telling you that that uh, collection of primary source material is fantastic. Uh, and really look it over. Think about it. Think about it. If you think about the world in terms of living in a free society where aggression is not allowed, and then you start to see all the different ways that aggression is used, where you haven't hurt anybody else, no one has committed violence, but the state is allowed to commit violence against you because you broke a rule that they made for some reason, <laughs> you know? When you start to analyze the world in that way, then suddenly the conspiracy theory, the crazy tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist, maybe starts to look like uh, they've seen through the curtain. They've seen behind the curtain and they know what the wizard is up to. Um, so again, www.government-scam.com. Check it out. And of course, uh, please go to www.theshiftnow.com where you can catch all of my interviews, The Shift with Doug McKinty, uh, plus uh, hours of free content. I got all of my old work up there, the roundtable discussions, the Thursday morning report, uh, <coughs> and the entire Psychology of Lockdown series, which is very pertinent to this whole conversation about cult indoctrination. Uh, it actually shows... Uh, some of the mechanisms that are used, some of the coping mechanisms that people develop against the trauma of being raised inside a patriarchal or cult-like system. And then those, those coping mechanisms get uh, triggered. And you have uh, something suddenly like, uh, like the COVID lockdowns uh, being possible. Uh, so um, please, again, check out www.theshiftnow.com and think about subscribing for the full-length feature uh, length interviews. Uh, I usually hold back about a half hour, 45 minutes, so you can get all of the in-depth interviews with each one of my guests uh, for just six bucks a month. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. Guys got to eat. So thanks everybody for checking this out. Uh, again, I hope you really take this idea of voluntarism to heart. If you're not uh, familiar with it, then look it up. Do some research. I think it, it can really help shift your paradigm from out of that left-right paradigm that is really trapping us all, divide and conquer, getting us to fight each other, and clearly uh, one aspect of the indoctrination uh, that just keeps the powerful powerful. Uh, so if you want to break the cycle of violence, check out voluntarism. Look it up. Do some reading. Uh, check out Etienne's book, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at theshiftnow.com as well. So thanks again for listening, and we will see you again next week. You guys have a great day. Take care. <music>